Thank you so much, and you know, it really is uh, an honor uh, to be invited to chat with all of you and um, uh, to be welcomed uh, to this uh, really exciting place, uh, a place that uh, thinks so much uh, of uh, each other in the earth that you have a center for earth jurisprudence, and I love that phrase, my goodness gracious, you know, earth jurisprudence. Why hadn't we thunk of that one earlier? So really, you should all take great pride in having an institution that thinks like that to have a very young institution with really great and bold new ideas. And so really a privilege and honor for me to come down and, and kind of share with you some thoughts. Uh, always a little humbling, you know, when I get these invitations. And, you know, I, I just celebrated my 62nd birthday. I really can't believe that. I'm in my sixth decade now. I don't feel like I've, you know, been here that long. And, uh, and I just keep, you know, uh, finding new mistakes to make. Uh, don't repeat the old ones, but I come up with new ones and always seem to find myself getting into trouble. Um, and like you, you know, I, I um, well, like you, I'm here at the beginning of this century and we're kind of trying to get by the toxic legacy of the past century and we're kind of looking forward to the next. And um, I got my doubts. I dare say I probably, several of you got some doubts. Are we gonna get there? How are we gonna get there? And is things gonna be uh, healthier? safer, better, um, how will we get there? And um, I have been kind of, you know, this has merely been a great experience and um, I know you probably don't want to hear about my pontificating about what I learned. You really want to know what it's like to have John Travolta play you. That's probably <laughs> why you invited me. So uh, I think my mother, who used to live in these parts, uh, and uh, has now uh, gone on another journey. Uh, and she uh, had the best answer. She was asked by a woman who was little and old and Jewish, Travolta. My mother said, well, you know, a handsome Italian boy playing a nice Jewish boy. What's not to like? Could have been Joe Pesci or Danny DeVito. <laughs> so, so that was one of the little benefits, you know, of that. Um, but listen, I went through this uh, Cuisinart of an experience. And of course, there was this really great book and a pretty good movie. And I certainly urge all of you, you know, to have that uh, kind of experience because this, it is like therapy. You know, uh, the book comes out, and the movie, and then, uh, you know, people you never met, they write about you, they talk about you. You know, I remember this one um, uh, reviewer in Time Magazine. He talked about me, he said uh, that I was, uh, described me as a uh, humorless vulpine. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I like a jo good joke, and I've been the butt of many. Uh, Volpine, I had to look that one up. You know, for you educated folks, I know you probably know that. It appears that Volpine is um, having the characteristic of an endangered species. It appears I'm on a list somewhere. Um, but, you know, I know how troubling it was for Travolta uh, when he was asked to uh, play this part. I know he, he uh, read the uh, proffered script and... Well, he jumped on one of his uh, six jets and he flew off to Burbank, you know, and uh, Burbank, uh, they have the dwarfs building. Remember those dwarfs? Well, they got them holding up this 70-foot tall building, a little menacing. Anyway, there on the seventh floor, he just laid it out to the Disney folks. He says, I can't play this Schlickman. He's too greedy, too materialistic. They said, um, how about $20 million? Okay, I'll try. <laughs> All I know is he made a hell of a lot more money playing me than I ever made playing me. <laughs> One of the little ironies. I got the experience, he got the cash. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't trade the, exp well, I might. Uh, I wouldn't trade the experience. It was um, enriching, uh, if you want to consider bankruptcy an enriching experience. Uh, and it was, and, uh, and it did uh, bankrupt me in all sorts of different ways. And the great thing about bankruptcy is that uh, you lose all the things and you got to look at what's left. And so I've had to go through that experience and, and uh, it was um, like a colonic, you know, uh, not pleasant when you're going through it, but uh, after you feel deliriously joyful when it's over. Uh, and I'm deliriously joyful that this experience is behind me. Uh, and it took me a long time to kind of piece together uh, and integrate the experience. But when I finally did 
accept it, and it came kind of in a blinding flash. Uh, in a particular moment, uh, things really, uh, I got a clarity, and, uh, and um, well, I valued the experience. And I want to kind of talk to you about that, because uh, it changed me, changed me as a lawyer, and uh, changed me as a human being, and it's nice to think of those two things as kind of, you know, you can be a lawyer and a human being, and I know they try really hard, and institutions, uh, not like this one, but like other law school institutions, they try very hard sometimes to kind of separate out the humanity from uh, uh, the law aspects, uh, and I don't think that's a good idea. I think we need to combine them. That's why I'm so enamored of the phrase Earth jurisprudence, because how we treat each other in the Earth, to me, is where it's all about. They're one and the same. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. You know, uh, I want to talk about where I was and where I am now and kind of share these thoughts uh, and hope that it uh, offers you something as you sit there at the beginning of, uh, of your journey and the choices that you'll be making. Maybe it'll offer something, and I hope it does, of value to you. So there I was, you know, um, I was, uh, well, I had dark hair. Uh, I still have my hair, which is all very good. I had dark hair, and life was good. You see, I had all the things. You know, it was the 80s, and we were really good at making things for people who liked things, and I loved things. And I was, you know, I felt I was good at what I was doing. I was fresh out of school and uh, full of uh, drive and ambition. And, um, you know, I, I just chose the path of a personal injury lawyer. And I know that warms the cockles of your heart to hear that. Oh, personal injury lawyers, we love those. Yes, every town should have one or two or three or a dozen. And uh, I really enjoyed being a personal injury lawyer because, um, well, you got to master some science or engineering or some little aspect of life, technological life that I didn't know about. And, uh, you know, if I, if I mastered it and I gathered all the facts together, why, uh, you know, I could win something for my client and something for myself. And life was good, you see, and, and uh, I got things. You know, I, I, uh, well, I got the clothes, you know, I got the car, everybody knows about the car. And uh, I got the condo, I got the career, I got the, col the colleagues, I got all the C's, I got it all, you know, life was great. And then those mothers from Woburn came into my office. And life was not to be the same. You see, they, they came in and they told me a story. And the story that they told me, well, it was Ann Anderson's story. Now, maybe some of you know it remember it, but I, it bears repeating. You see, uh, with Anne's story was that um, she and her husband, you know, they moved to Woburn. It's a working class community uh, just uh, north of Boston, and it's got tree-lined streets, and uh, they moved in there in the 1960s, and um, well, life was really good. You know, uh, the fact they had two new wells that they turned on, wells G and H, to welcome new neighbors and new industry, and post-war America, in which we were moving from uh, the smokestacks to another kind of industry that had no stacks, a clean industry, so we thought. And life was really great. And they were blessed with children. And uh, Jimmy was the youngest. And then there was that time, it's February, 1972. And it was uh, a terrible day where um, you know, the family had been just getting over the latest round of flu, but Jimmy, he wasn't getting better. And Ann became concerned. And so she took Jimmy to the local doc. He became very concerned. And they were sent down to the Mass General Hospital where Ann learned to her horror that her son Jimmy had a disease that uh, she had never heard of before, leukemia. Now, the nightmare of this diagnosis was soon replaced with this terrible nightmare of a roller coaster ride between remission, where the disease seemed to go away, and relapse. Up and down, up and down. And Anne would go to the waiting room while Jimmy would uh, have his chemotherapy treatments. And uh, she had never heard of this disease before, leukemia. But now, of course, this was a name she couldn't get out of her head. And it was in the waiting room that she was struck by something. You see, in that waiting room, while she was waiting for Jimmy to be treated, she saw another mother whose child was being treated. And this was a mother who she recognized in the neighborhood. And she saw another mother, and she recognized that mother from the supermarket. And another mother who she recognized from the church. 
And there just seemed to be too many of these mothers with children being treated with this disease she'd never heard of before. And so she got the courage to actually get up, and it took courage, and walk across the waiting room floor and sit down, and together they shared uh, what they knew. And um, it was in this uh, sharing that Anne's head became filled with questions. You know, and she, she would think about, uh, well, this disease it, uh, that she never heard of before. And, and uh, she talked to the doctor. Well, what causes this disease? And the doctor said, oh, well, you know, scientists don't know. Uh, some think a virus. Anne thought about the water. You know, it tastes bad. It smells bad. People have been complaining about it for years. Why? Maybe there's a virus in the water making the children sick. Well, she told her husband about it. Oh, no, 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 no. Why? Why, if that were the case, why the authorities would have told us? Oh, and so she called them up. Oh, no, no, the water is test safe. It's safe. And so it was like that for several years until one morning in May 1979 where Anne woke up to read in the paper that the chemicals that she told were, the water that she was told was safe was not safe, but contaminated with chemicals that she never heard of before. Transdichloroethylene, benzene, and uh, trichloroethylene, all these uh, new chemical names. And she read in the paper how uh, when fed to mice, the mice, uh, involuntarily of course, uh, the mice got cancer at an absorbent rate. And she said, oh, that was it. Maybe it is the water contaminated. Now she went to the mothers and they went on a mission. And they went to the new agency, the Environmental Protection Agency, young agency, and they went down there and they said, hey, uh, we've got these wells that are contaminated. Uh, we'd like to know who and we'd like to know when. And the agency, you know, to their credit, young agency, decided to, hey, go up to Woburn and help them uh, answer those questions. Now, Ann also was not satisfied. She went and gathered the mothers uh, together and um, she wanted to find out about this incidence of cancer, how many there were. And uh, nobody could answer that question. And so what she did was she went around in the neighborhood and went door to door, the mothers did, and asked a simple question. Do you have a child? Does the child have cancer? Is it leukemia? When? And they gathered that information together and then they put together a map and they put pins in the map and they saw all the numbers of children over a 12-year period, over two dozen, over a 12-year period, too many. And so they took that information and they went to the Center for Disease Control and they said, look, uh, there are too many children with cancer in our community. We want to know if the water that we know is contaminated was responsible. And the Center for Disease Control, to its credit, went up to Woburn to work with the State Department of Health to answer that question. Well, they, uh, after they did a lot of time and a lot of money, why the agencies, they brought the families together at a place very much like this, and um, they gave them the results of their work. You see, the EPA got up and said, well, we can tell you definitively, the wells are contaminated with chemicals. We can't tell you who. We can't tell you when. They sat down. The Center for Disease Control, the State Department of Health got up and said, well, we can tell you definitively, there are too many children with this disease in this community, but we cannot tell you if the water is responsible. And so it ended. A very interesting decision. They decided to get a lawyer, get me. <laughs> Figuring that if they get a lawyer, get me, they get an answer to their questions. Now, I remember being in that room, you know, looking at the car out in the parking lot, and my beautiful office, all those cases, and this career on an arc, and I hear their story. Well, I'm a human being too, and I was touched by it. Now, also a lawyer, I'm a businessman, and I had to explain things. <laughs> Let me explain. Now, this was obviously a touching story, a terrible story. I mean, who would not be touched, even me, by such a story? But I got to explain something. I'm a lawyer. You see, when someone comes to me with a problem, um, I don't answer, I don't get answers to questions. You see, I take the problem and I examine it. Now, if I can make a case out of it, I can help. And if I can't make a case out of it, I can't help. Now, let me just give you the analysis. You know, I went to a very fine law school. They taught me well. I've had some hard experience. What works, what doesn't. It's real simple. I'm a tort lawyer. 
Well, let's see. Let's do the analysis. There's got to be a wrong. Contaminated water. I'll bet you that's wrong. Somebody contaminates the water supply. That's got to be wrong. OK, check that list. Wrongdoer. There's got to be somebody who did the wrong. And uh, there's got to be somebody who did the wrong who's got the what to make it all worthwhile. Little footnote there. Uh, who, who did it? Oh, uh, the authorities don't know. The authorities don't know. I'm thinking, well, gee, how much time, how much money would I have to spend to find out who? And after I found out the who, would they have the what to make it all worthwhile? Hmm. No, can't check that one. Oh, how about this? Between the wrong and the wrongdoer, there has to be a terrible injury, you know, something that's worth law taking uh, notice of. Well, children with leukemia, my goodness, you can't get any more terrible than that. Some even died at that point, oh my goodness. So yeah, there was damages, check that box. But the law requires something else between a wrong and a wrongdoer and damages. There must be this thing called causation. Did, uh, did your doctors tell you uh, if the water was responsible? Oh, no, 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 the doctors don't know. The doctors don't know. <sighs> well, let's see. Could I find a doctor or a scientist in this country um, who I could get to testify, and after he sobered up, what kind of witness would he make? No, uh, no, 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 no. I knew, I was smart enough to know, I didn't have the wisdom, I didn't have the experience, and I didn't have the resources to take on such a case. And I told them so. But these mothers, they were a special breed. They didn't seem to take no for an answer. You know, so uh, I said, okay, okay, I got it, I got it. You're right, you're right. Look, I'm also a, a human being here. You deserve something like I'm going to go knock on the doors of those who have more resources and more experience and more wisdom, and I'll get back to you. And I did. You see, I knocked on the doors of those who have more experience and wisdom and resources, and I found out why they had more experience and wisdom and resources. They said they were busy, but thank you very much. OK, back to the families I came to a place like this, you see. And I told them the truth. I can't help you. I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me? Do you know what they did? Do you know what these families, these mothers did? How dare they? They held their children up. I said, don't you get it? Our, our children, they're, they're choking to death on the lies. We need the truth. The truth? I'm a lawyer. <laughs> the truth? Me? A lawyer? Truth? No. Uh, you know, truth, that's, uh, you got to go uh, invade, you know, you got to go, that's something you take, and there's risk involved, and, you know, and I, mm, let me think about it. So I did. I did what lawyers do. I did a little investigation, you know, the kind that lawyers do. Got my shoes dirty, and I, I went out there and did a little looking around and reading things, you know, the stuff that lawyers kind of do, and it was interesting. You see, I, uh, well, I, I saw that there was, uh, well, W.R. Grace uh, that had uh, pollution found on its property, and they were 2,400 feet northeast of the wells. And, and then I, I saw the uh, John, J. Riley, John J. Riley Tannery uh, purchased by Beatrice, you know, and, um, and I saw that their property notoriously contaminated, drums and things like that. And of course, these were two at that time, two of the largest corporations in the world. Now, just to show you where we've come from, I think uh, Grace was six billion and Beatrice was eight billion dollars. That was big money in those days. You know, uh, they were like, uh, you know, fourteenth uh, and twelfth in the scale of big companies, and they were getting bigger. And uh, so that was kind of intriguing to me, you know. And so I sat in my office, and I started to think like a lawyer and a businessman. You know, I thought about uh, and a human being, of course. Let's not forget that. You know, I well, I thought about the children. I thought about the need. I thought about the challenge. And I thought about the treasure. You see, I was smart enough as a lawyer and a businessman and a human being to know that if I did take on this thing, if I did get this truth and I pulled it out, why, why people may just pay huge sums of money to possess this thing. And, uh, I thought about it all, you see, and I said, yeah, this is what I want to do. I told my two partners, hey, and they said, hey, all for one and one for all, and we were in and joined the families on their journey. 
and what a journey this was. You know, this was a journey like all great journeys. You see, this was a, a journey into science and engineering and politics and the law and the legal system. Not always the same thing. And like all great journeys, it was a personal one and in the end, a spiritual one too. And um, well, it required all sorts of things. You see, uh, well, we went on this journey to discover certain things, and we didn't discover or get the things, the treasure that I thought, but there were some other treasures that we did get. You see, we went on a journey and, well, we learned about um, the truth about these chemicals and the conduct that kills, but we learned about something even more fundamental than that, the importance of truth to life itself. But I'm getting ahead of myself, you see, because, um, well, I... Uh, well, we went to an expert. We did what lawyers are supposed to do. You see, I went to an expert, and they sent me to another expert. And that expert, well, they sent me to this other expert, and then they sent me to this expert, and, and then to that, and oh, I, all these, two dozen experts, and uh, oh my goodness, and I, this isn't working. So we decided to do something unusual. You see, we brought them all together. All together, one room at one time, at one place, just like this place, just like this, you see, and we put them all together, you see, and there was a, a geologist, and a hydrogeologist, and a toxicologist, and an immunologist, and a cardiologist, and a neurologist, and a psychiatrist, mostly for me and my two partners. <laughs> we put all the ologists together, and they had to go uh, confront an issue. Can these chemicals in water make children sick? Can it give them cancer? And all of these experts together had to figure things out. We had to understand the making of things. We learned that, you know, when you make things, you make waste. We had to understand what they did with the waste at the end of the day. And then we had to understand what, when they dumped it into the ground to get rid of it, where it went, and what happened to folks when it got there. And we learned a lot of interesting things that had never really uh, been learned before. Well, we learned about these chemicals. You see, when we started out, they said, they, the ones who command the conversation, said, oh my goodness, such tiny amounts. They're just a little solvent in the water. We learned something about solvents. They're volatile. And it's not the drinking of the water that gets the biggest dose, but because they volatilize in the toilet, in the dishwasher, from the sink and the shower, it volatilizes. A change of physics occurs, and all of a sudden, what's little becomes quite big, and big doses to people who are exposed just living in the house. The enriching, as they say, funny word, of the household air, just living there, dosing the people. Well, that was interesting. We learned something else. It was a new science spurred on by the trying to deal with the scourge of AIDS and all the work that had been done in T-cells and immunology and DNA. And, and we learned some things. Yeah, they were tiny amounts, but not so tiny that the body didn't recognize them and tried to get rid of them. And in the act of trying to get rid of these things that were foreign to the body, a strand was broken in that strand of life, a place where a cancer can take root. We learned about the chemicals and the conduct and their waste and where it went and we started to put the pieces together and I have to tell you, it was intoxicating. I was in that room hearing these experts with these incredible credentials and what were they doing? They were putting the pieces of a case together, the case that nobody had ever done before. We could be the one, I could be the one who did the case that had never been done before. Oh my goodness gracious. I loved it, intoxicated with it. And we did the case that no one ever done before. And we did what you know, the law gives us. The law gives us great power. And we use that power. We use that power like all lawyers do. The law gives you power, and lawyers are given a special license to use that power, and we use that power, and we did what lawyers are supposed to do in a situation like this. We sued the bastards. We got permission. The law gave us that permission to go on their land. And we took that power, and the law gave us permission to look for things. And I learned about things. I learned about things 
that people have that they don't want other people to know about. I learned what people do with things that they don't want other people to know about. What do they do with such things? They bury them in pits. I learned a lot about pits. Pits, they're, um, well, they're deep, and they're dirty, and they're dangerous. I learned something else about things being buried in such places. I learned that uh, bury them as deep as you will, they have a strange way of resurfacing. And another kind of anti-intuitive thing about pits, when you jump in to someone's pit and you start digging in such a place, they usually return the favor and go into your property and start digging into your pits where you buried things and start finding things. And when you invade each other's land, and when you're digging around in each other's pits for things that people are hiding, there's conflict. And with conflict, there's war. And war is the only way to express it. And this war is like every other war. And unfortunately for us at this time in our history, we are rich. We have been enriched by war, an impoverishing experience. War, and this war is like every other war. It went on too long. And this war, like every war, ended the only way a war can end, in exhaustion. And this war, like every other war, had what every war has, war stories. And I'd like to share some with you. Thank you. I will. You see, in this war, this war is conducted by the, well, not by the rules of the Marcus of Queensberry. No, no, no. Um, this war is ruled by rules, legal rules, and different things. And it's propelled by a metaphor, an understanding of something, the truth, and how we extract it. How can you extract the truth? Because the law says that it values the truth. And the, this extraction process that we're all well skilled in comes on a very fundamental 16th century premise. And it proved great value. They had marvelous ways of extracting the truth from folks in the 16th century. It worked really well. If you were accused of being a witch, why, they just dunk you in the water? And if you come up alive, you're a witch. And if you don't, you weren't. Case <laughs> resolved. If, you're, if it's important for us to know who did what to whom and when, no problem. Bring them in take out a stone, pile it on their chest, and keep piling it on until their lung collapses and the truth is expelled from their lips. This is a tried and true, time-honored tradition that the law adopted. And it took this marvelous extractive metaphor and it said, if you put pains over here and you put penalties over here and you put a human being between the two of them, why they will not perjure themselves because they're under the pains and the penalties of perjury. Of course, we know this engine of truth mechanism, why it works. And we have this elaborate system, which I took great pride in using through the deposition process, and they did too, where you grab some person and bring them to a place they don't want to be, and you ask them questions they don't want to answer, and you keep them there for as long as the law will allow you to do it until you have extracted the truth. And it worked unbelievably well in this case. I remember they called our headologist, and they brought him in there to tell the truth. And I remember the lawyer for Beatrice, he was the best, you see, and he, he asked them questions hour after hour, all of his research all that stuff, and then uh, what he did, and his opinions, and everything. And finally, he said, Doctor, I just got one last question. Name the study. Name the study that shows that children exposed to these chemicals in water can give them cancer. And I remind you, Doctor, you're under oath. Well, the doctor didn't have to be reminded. He said, there are none. But ask me that question in a year. How so? This will be the study. I remember sitting there in the deposition and wondering, is that study going to come out before the trial or after the trial? <laughs> then I had my chance, and I took their people, 
and I grabbed them, and I put them in my room, and I put pains over here and penalties over there, and I sat them down and reminded them they were under oath. What chemicals did you use? I don't know. What'd you do with them at the end of the day? I don't know. What'd you do with them? I don't know. You don't know. You don't know. You don't, I remind you, there's pains over here and penalty over there. I don't know. I don't know. They didn't tell me. I don't know. I remember that there was this fella, and it was interesting, this fella. His name was Al Love, and he worked for W.R. Grace. And I remember bringing in one employee after another employee, and then there was Al Love. And I was asking him, I don't know, well, um, on and on. And finally we took a break, and I went, you know, with my partner, Kevin. He said, Kevin, gee, I don't know, I'm not getting anywhere. He says, yeah, you can tell, yeah, I know. We've been here weeks, we're not getting anywhere. But you know, I had a thought, Jan, what's that? Well, this Al Love guy, he lives across the street from Ann Anderson. He's got children. Why don't you ask him how he feels about the water? How he feels about his children? What he thinks? I said, Kevin, that is the most ridiculous. Okay. And I did. You see, I remember that. I remember asking him these simple little questions, you know, human little questions. And I remember that the lawyers for Grace and Beatrice, they laughed. But Al, he wasn't laughing. No, he said he got a headache. He said he got a headache that wouldn't go away that day or the next day. And the headache propelled him to walk across the street to Ann Anderson's house. And at Ann Anderson's house, he shared with her what he knew. And then the two of them went to, the, to me. And then the three of us went to the US attorney and shared what we knew. And something interesting happened. W.R. Grace became the first Fortune 500 company that ever been indicted for not telling the truth to the EPA about the chemicals that they used and what they did with them. I remember another story of another person at the time of trial, Tom Mernon. He lived across the street from the Toomeys. They lost their son, Patrick, to leukemia. And I remember how Richard used to talk about how Tom, who was the city engineer in charge of, you know, Wells g &H, and I remember him going to, to Mernon's house and say, hey, come on over, you know, this water, is something wrong. Oh, don't worry about it. Uh, uh, Richard, it's, uh, it's the pipes. Oh, the pipes, the pipes, I see. Then there was the trial. I remember the trial. They only called one fact witness. Everything else was an expert. Tom Mernon was their fact witness. I remember him coming in, and they asked him questions about when he turned the wells on, when he turned the wells off, and he gave answers, and it didn't really quite comply with the documents that we had. And I remember he left. But I remember long after he left, he was diagnosed with leukemia. And he told the family's reverend, he said, it, it touched me too. It, it touched me too. You know, I remember there was this worker from the tannery. I remember he was in my office under the pains and the penalties. And I remember he told me nothing. I also remember when that trial was over, and we took the case on appeal for Beatrice. I remember on appeal that the tannery broke the contract, closed the tannery down, and sent all the employees home. I remember it was that afternoon, that afternoon when they broke the contract, that I was in the home of that tannery employee who months before was in my office with pains and penalties, not talking. And I remember being in that kitchen at that table, and he was on that chair, and I was on the other, and he said, I have leukemia, and I want to tell you something. And I remember he told me something, and I remember my reaction after he told me this thing. I became intoxicated again. I went to the lawyer for Beatrice Foods. You see, I confronted him. I remember looking into those eyes. You know. I said, I want the truth. I remember him looking back. Oh, you want the truth? Yes, damn it. Oh, the truth. The truth. It's, it's over there. Where? It's over in that pit. Which one? That bottomless one. I pushed him aside. I pushed my partners aside. I jumped into that pit. I was determined to get to the bottom, you know, digging, 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 digging. But the thing about bottomless pits, you never quite ever get to the bottom. But I dug, and then finally I had to rest. I was nearly exhausted, but in the diggings, 
I saw things, things that glittered. Well, this was um, evidence that evidence had been withheld. And this was evidence that evidence had been destroyed. And this was evidence of false testimony perjury. I remember grabbing all of these glittering things and stuffing them in my pocket and running to this place that we're all taught to go with such secrets. I went into that place and I took what I'd stuffed in my pockets and I put it on the table before a very unique individual, a United States federal judge. <laughs> now I know you learn a lot about these folks here in this institution, what they think, what they do, what they had for breakfast, or maybe didn't have for breakfast, what they should have for breakfast, whether they're on medication, off medication. You learn a lot about these judges because there's a cardinal rule that all lawyers should follow. Federal judges can get really angry. And this federal judge, after I spilled out this onto the table, my little treasure, got really, really angry. And I'm telling you, federal judges can get angry. And he did, but not at them, at me, for coming out with it. How dare I? I remember running from the courtroom with his words burning in my ears. It's too late for the truth. Too late for the truth. So I did what any self-respecting lawyer should do in such a circumstance. I went to the place they teach us about because it's not just the judge at the trial court level. Of course not. There's another place you get to go. And I went there. It's a different set of rules. You see, there you're not allowed to talk to the folks inside. No. Different, different kind of rule. You see, you got to go, uh, well, you come there with one purpose and one purpose only, to write this wrong. And you write it down. Write this wrong. And you put down there very persuasively all the law, all the facts, write this wrong, and then you put it into the door and you wait. It takes a long time, but it comes back out eventually, and it did. And I remember reading it, and I said, well, wait a minute, you wrote this wrong. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, you got a problem with that? You got to go to another place. We know that place. We all talk about that place, mythologize that place. And I went to that place, that place that every lawyer dreams of going to right that wrong, and I did. I went there, a different set of rules. You're not allowed to talk to the folks inside. So I did what they, what they call a special procedure. I'm sure you learned about it here. It's called a, a petition. What's a petition? You stand outside the building, and you say, help. And eventually, a little man, it's a little man. He's still there, very old, comes to the door. He says, um, gee, I'm sorry, but the judges are very and the door closes. And I remember that moment, you see, because when that happened, when that door closed, I went to get in the car. It was gone. I rushed back to my condo. It was gone. I looked for my clothes. It was all gone. My colleagues, my career, it was all gone. It's, I looked around, and there was no thing -ness. Nothing. Oh, my God. And then I started to think, how did I ever get here? What happened? How, how come I have no thing? And, and then I began to think about how I got there and the pain of it. Oh, my God. And I couldn't take it. You see, I did what any self-respecting human being would do in such a circumstance when you have nothing. I went as far as you can go in this country and still be in this country. Hawaii, not a bad place to go if you're having a midlife crisis. And when you have yours, I urge you to go there. <laughs> it's a very beautiful place, a soothing place. And I went to that beautiful, soothing pay place, and all I had was pain. I wanted my life to start anew. No law, no past, a new life. It didn't happen. But you know, um, something did happen back here. You see, the EPA, the change in administration. Hmm. And the administration that changed looked at all the stuff that we had shared with the EPA, and they said, hmm, the families were right. And they did something unusual. They called the companies up. And they did something more unusual. They invited them to a place like this, and they shared with them what they knew. And after all that sharing, something really interesting happened. The companies decided to pay for a cleanup, $70 million. It'll take 50 years. We're in our uh, third decade. And um, it'll, take, it'll take a while. Something else interesting happened. You see, um, I decided to make it back home to my beginnings, to get this pain out of my head. And I did. I came back to this place, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. 
it's like a granite headland cliff. It's my home. And on this granite headland cliff overlooks the ocean. It was there. When I came home, I had to confront the past, and you always do. And when I confronted the past, it was nothing but pain. And, and the pain, it, it just filled my head. And I couldn't see anything but pain, everything that I'd lost, and nothing that I had gained, you see. And I, I began to stumble. I began to tumble. And I nearly tumbled all the way over the edge, you see. And I, I flailing wildly, I managed to grab hold of the outstretched fingers of a branch. And I, well, I held on for dear life, you see. But, but I knew that. Uh, well, I couldn't see any way up, and I couldn't see any way out, and I, I just knew. I just knew that in my exhausted state that it would just be a matter of time before I'd let go. So I, so I closed my eyes to my fate. And you know, something interesting happened. Between that long, endless silence, swinging between life and death, it came to me. I was holding something in my hand, something vital. And this thought inspired me to look up and see that one branch, it leads to another, and to a limb, and from the limb to the trunk, and from the trunk to solid ground. And I was so overjoyed by my accomplishment that I decided to make this place my home. And I, I started to think about things. And I stayed here so long thinking about things that I, I decided to make this place my home, and I married. And then uh, two children came forth. Two more reasons to want to stay safely rooted right here on this place. Now, something else interesting happened. The book came out. And then the phone calls, always on a Sunday. Oh, listen, Mr. Schlickman, Attorney Schlickman, I, I read this book, and I saw how you gave up everything for your clients, including your sanity. Why, you sound like just a lawyer for me. Ah! <laughs> I'm a little tired. I got a family. No, thank you. But you know what? I did get a call from a mother. It's always a mother. From Tom's River. Two companies. It's always two companies. Two big companies. It's always two big companies. Polluted the well. A lot of sick children. Cancer. We were wondering, maybe you learned something? Would you mind coming down and sharing with us what you learned? Well, I couldn't say no to her, so I did. I went down into that sacred place, the living room, and there in that living room, the mothers were there, and we did something interesting. You see, we shared our experience. And after all that sharing, something interesting happened. An idea popped into the head, and we decided to form a partnership. I love that word. A partnership between lawyer and client. Partners. Now, let's just tease that one out a little bit. Partners. You see, they look at each other as equals. They look at problem solving the way partners do, something you do together. Partners, they look at resources as something you need to share together and conserve together. And we were so excited about this concept of partnership between lawyer and client, we decided to form a partnership with the local government, and a partnership with the state government, and a partnership with the federal government. And then, so intoxicated with that idea, I decided to go knock on the doors of the lawyers for the companies. And who should answer the door but the lawyer for Beecher's Foods? Ah! Well, it's not like we didn't have something to talk about. <laughs> so we did. We came to a place like this. And we sat down and we shared the way lawyers share. You know how they share. And we did little bits and pieces of sharing. And after a while, uh, talking, we had a lot of things to talk about. And we did. And after all that, we came to a limited partnership. And the limited partnership was we would agree to come in and talk again. And again, and share what we knew, and share what we were finding. And I think we shared more on our side than their side, but that's OK. And we kept up talking. And then something really interesting happened. Over time, we decided to bring in another party to kind of help us. And after that, something really interesting happened. We came to a resolution, the way human beings can come to a resolution, even about great tragedies. And we wrote it down, the way lawyers can do. Uh, a document that did what? That gave the economic tools to the families to dig out of the rubble of their experience. And it was some time after that that something really interesting happened. The Center for Disease Control, in the wake of Woburn, charged by Congress, formed the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, the ATSDR. And this was an agency charged in the wake of Woburn to help communities determine 
if an environmental catastrophe is affecting the public's health. And the ATSDR, in conjunction with the State Department of Health and the Mass Commonwealth of Massachusetts, went back up and looked at the information that we had shared with them, and they did something really interesting. They called the community together, and there we were, the families, and I, and the community. And at that night, that wonderful summer night, they announced that the families were right, that the studies show that the children who were exposed in utero to this chemically contaminated water had a 13 times greater risk of contracting the disease than those who were not. And the data was so compelling that that agency, the first time in history, any governmental agency, any university, they came to a conclusion that there was a connection between the drinking water and the cluster of leukemia. I remember that night. I remember going home in the company of the families that night, and there were not so many as when we first started, and it had been 15 years since uh, Jimmy Anderson had died. But I remember that night. I remember something really interesting in my head. There was no pain. There was only joy, joy about something. I realized in that one moment that the judge was wrong. It's never too late for the truth. And I thought about that, the truth. Maybe I was thinking about the truth all wrong. Maybe the truth is not something that you have to go and get. Maybe the truth is not something that you have to go and take. Truth is not something that you use as a weapon. The truth, it's all around us. And you don't have to go and get it. It comes to us when we share experience. And when we share experience, soil is created in which life can take root. And since that time, I've, I've had some opportunity to kind of think about things. As I recycle myself back into this thing, and my wife asks me every morning, do you practice law? What exactly is it that you're doing? And uh, <laughs> I'm not quite so sure, but I do have this thought. And I will end with this thought. I'd like to share it with you. I want to extend to you the branch that was extended to me. You see, as we sit here and look out and try to imagine the end of this century and what life will be like, whether there will be life and what kind of life for ourselves, for our children and their children, when we do that, maybe, maybe we need to think about that fundamental metaphor that propels us and maybe this time, after 200 years of the Industrial Revolution that is now being played out and leaving its devastated, devegetated zones, maybe, maybe this time we'll root ourselves in a metaphor taken from life, except the teaching of life, the one that life offers us every day if we choose to accept it. When life is shared, life is given, so life can go on. And maybe, 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 if we incorporate that idea, that principle of life all around us, maybe we, as humans, and we, as lawyers who wish also to be humans, maybe, if we employ that principle, we will help all of us to learn to live with each other on this earth together. Thank you.